Welcome to part two of the Civil War. This one has 44 slides. It shouldn't take two, it shouldn't take as long as the first one did. Um, but anyway, what we start to see in 1863 is there is a shift. It starts going um, the way of the Union. They start to win battles. The, stuff, the South is suffering, um, mostly from the blockade. I mean, they're really hungry. Um, their morale is low. Uh, people are deserting. As a matter of fact, uh, if you desert, you will be killed. Uh, anybody who doesn't serve in the military would be killed. So they have a lot of struggles and infighting going on in the South. Um, the North starts to win significant battles. There are only two battles that take place in the North. So while the South is suffering from the, the fighting that's taking place down there, um, the North is actually prospering. Um, they're building all of these products for the war effort. People are, are working. Millionaires are being made. They're not suffering the same. They don't see the suffering. Uh, there might be um, loved ones who are dying, um, missing limbs, and that sort of thing, but they are not suffering the way that the South did. Part of the success that the Union was experiencing had to do with the Battle of New Orleans, something that your book didn't talk about. I think that they barely mentioned it. But anyway, um, Union Admiral David Farragut was able to breach a chain that the Confederates had put up to halt anyone from coming in and entering the Mississippi River uh, at New, or New Orleans. So that was their prime defense there. So once they get control of New Orleans and they control the Mississippi River, so it's going to be a matter of gaining Vicksburg um, the following year, and then they get the whole thing. And part of the Anaconda um, plan would be realized in gaining control of the Mississippi River and separating um, the two portions of the South. So anyway, the city fell to the Union April 25th, um, and uh, B.F. Butler, uh, Union General, he led troops into the city, um, capturing it. Okay, so then um, we're going to get Vicksburg in July 4th, 1863. So Grant is out there in the West, right? Um, he was there from the Battle of Shiloh. He had come down. Um, he and his army are driving across uh, Tennessee um, to get to the Mississippi River. And then they were attacked um, by, um, was it Johnson's forces or Jackson's forces, I believe. Um, so they, they were attacked, but they were able to defeat them. And then so with the Battle of Vicksburg, uh, then the plan of securing the Mississippi River was finalized and realized. So Vicksburg was captured on July 4th. Um, by the time that word got out about that, word's also coming out about Gettysburg. Gettysburg happens from July 1st through the 3rd. So anyway, Lee advances up north. Um, he's hoping to capture a northern city so that he can hold it and then say, hey, we're going to force you to the negotiation table, and then we're going to have peace. Uh, we're going to be independent country. Or he could gain, through a victory, foreign intervention by England or France. So anyway, it all happens like this. Uh, General Meade, uh, Union General Meade, he was surprised as Lee's army, the, the Confederate army, um, comes up at these crossroads at Gettysburg. He didn't know that they were there, so fighting ensues right there. And then July 2nd, the fighting gets heavier um, as the Confederates attack from both the left and the right. On the 3rd, Lee ordered an attack of like 15,000 troops to go up the center of Cemetery Ridge, something known as Pickett's Charge. Had they been successful at this charge, then they probably would have won the battle. As it was, they were able to hold them off, and so Lee was forced to have to withdraw all of his troops, and they went down towards uh, Virginia on July 4th. So this was a huge victory for the Union um, with Gettysburg and that coupled with Vicksburg. This is the beginning of the end, right? The war is going to be over in April of 1864, so it's just a matter of time. Um, later, um, 
Abraham Lincoln and others would come back, uh, and we're going to get the Gettysburg Address, which we'll talk about uh, in a minute, to commemorate what was done there and to also encourage people to keep up the fight. So here is here are a couple things to look at. So on the top left here, there's an image. Um, this shows Lee where he came. So from the Battle of Fredericksburg and then um, what was that? Chancellorsville. Then he comes up here uh, to Gettysburg, which is in the southern part of um, Pennsylvania. So not far from where Antietam was. Okay, then you can see on the right here, this is one of those military battle maps. So the Union forces are in green, and then the Confederate forces are in red. And I want you to notice right here at this peach orchard, um, we're going to get the Confederates breach the Union forces right there, and they go up and then they meet the second group of them up here. Now, the thing about the Union is they have the advantage of the high ground. This right here is a very important Pickett's charge. Now, if Pickett had been successful, look what would have happened. They would have gotten right here. They would have flanked all these other troops. They would have come in behind, essentially surrounding the Union forces. Thankfully, um, they, they were not successful. And so the Union was able to push Lee's army back, and that forced the retreat. He goes down into Virginia, never to try to attack another northern city uh, again. And basically, at this point, Grant's and Grant's forces, when Lee retreats into Virginia, are going to continue to just uh, pursue Lee's. Okay, so here is the Gettysburg Address. Um, so the battle was in July, and in November, um, what they do is they exhume the bodies and they, they put them in an orderly manner um, and make it a cemetery. And Abraham Lincoln comes, he's followed behind, he gives a speech, he's followed behind some guy that gives this long three hour speech. Lincoln pulls this speech out of his hat because he kept a lot of stuff up in his big hat. But um, I'm going to read it to you whether you like it or not. Four score and seven years ago, so he's talking about when the Declaration of Independence was created, our father, fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that the nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note, no long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work. He's encouraging people, we have to continue this. It's kind of like a pep talk. Which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great, great task remaining before us that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they here gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people should not perish from this earth. So he's using some words that were familiar to people because it's very similar to what Daniel Webster said. After a series of trials and errors, uh, Abraham Lincoln finally found a general who he could count on, and he chose General Ulysses S. Grant. Um, he was made the commander early in 1864, and then um, William Tecumseh Sherman was made the commander of forces in the West, but uh, Grant was the force, he was commander of all U.S. forces. Um, so anyway, what uh, Grant wanted 
Um, he wanted to fight a war of attrition by cutting off the Confederate supply lines and hindering their ability to fight. Uh, his army suffered more losses uh, than Lee's, some people say. Um, I've heard other people argue that they had about the same rate. Um, but he was just hard charging. He just went forward, um, you know, and, and he, he, was, he was not afraid to put himself or his men out there. Um, the, the weird thing is, though, that he's a, he hated the sight of blood. Uh, so he didn't like that. Uh, but anyway, by the time of the surrender of Lee at Appomattox, um, he and Lincoln had forged this really strong uh, relationship, working very closely together. As a matter of fact, um, Lincoln asked him if Robert Todd, Lincoln's son, who really wanted to enlist, could um, work under Grant and Grant uh, did that for him. Uh, but anyway, he was very willing to fight an aggressive war. He was a self-starter. He had this real quiet uh, sort of self-confidence about him, which Lincoln really liked. They were both kind of similar that way. Um, both Lincoln and um, Grant had overcome some real hard scramble uh, upbringings, and uh, they're both from the American heartland, and they both married into slave-owning families. So they had some similarities. I think they just kind of got one another. Okay, and then there's William Tecumseh Sherman, um, who he wanted to, he also um, fought the war that Grant wanted him to with the War of Attrition. Uh, both of them were graduates of West Point, as was McCle McClellan, as was Lee. Uh, but anyway, he implemented this War of Attrition to prevent the enemies from having the ability to fight. So they got the Union victory at Chattanooga, and you can see, well, you can't see it on here, but Chattanooga is to the north and the west of Atlanta, so they're crossing down over the mountains, and then um, he takes a Union force of about 100,000, 100, and then they move into Georgia. First, they take Atlanta in September of 1864. Um, and then they start moving towards um, Savannah. Eventually, they go up to the Carolinas as well. The timing of this was crucial for Abraham Lincoln to get reelected. Um, so the Sherman took Atlanta uh, September 2nd, and that really helped Lincoln's uh, cause because the war wasn't going all that great. I mean, there was a, the victory at Gettysburg and Vicksburg, uh, but that had been the year before, and the war just seemed to be dragging on and dragging on. Lincoln's fighting a tough re-election bid up against George McClellan, and so this helped him uh, a great deal. So as they go, um, what they do is they destroy everything in their wake. Um, they go, you know, they go to homes and they, they get the sustenance they need. They need food. They only burn down homes or barns if the people are belligerent to them. Um, they, they destroy businesses. They destroy railroads. They just destroy munitions plants, anything that can help the enemy. They destroy cotton fields. They destroy um, anything they can't carry, basically except for people's personal property, uh, their homes, again, only if they fought there. Um, so what they did is they did kind of, a, they split up and then go do this all the way down there. They would take railroad ties and then kind of bend them so that they don't have a railroad to use. So they do all of these things and it really breaks the morale of the South. And what's going to happen is the South is going to have a very, very difficult winter, uh, the winter of 64 65, which is going to bring about the surrender in the spring. So as I said, George McClellan challenged Abraham Lincoln for the presidency in 1864. He was chosen by the Democrats to run against him. The Copperheads favored immediate peace with the Confederacy, and so did the, the war Democrats, though, sought to continue the war um, and then get a, uh, an immediate they, they, they wanted to bring together the Union. So at the convention, the platform advocated peace with the Confederacy, and then the Republicans, they nominated Abraham Lincoln, even though there were some uh, that wanted to ditch him. I think Sam and Chase ran against him in 1864. There was some division, too, John Fremont and others um, that were, they, they thought that Lincoln was far too 
um, moderate on racial equality. They wanted him to be more assertive. So you had the, the moderate Republicans, and then you had the radical Republicans. Some people didn't think that uh, Lincoln was uh, assertive enough, right? So uh, the party, though, was renamed the National Union Party in response to the radical Republicans because they wanted to attract war Democrats and other people coming over. And so what they, uh, coming over from the Democratic side, so what they did, they chose a Democrat to be Lincoln's running mate in this presidential election. Um, there was Harry Hamlin who had been uh, Lincoln's first vice president, and now they chose Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson was a senator from Tennessee, the only senator not to resign when the South seceded. And so he was chosen, and he was also a war Democrat. And so you've got together this Republican and a Democrat. Lincoln wanted to try to show unity uh, going forward, and he also wanted to try to pick up as many votes as he could uh, in this election from the Democratic side. And it worked. So here's a political cartoon. If you see this, the guy on the left, our left, is supposed to be Abraham Lincoln, and the guy on the right is supposed to be Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy. And the man in the middle who can bring everything back together is George McClellan. Um, so the author of this, or the creator of this, would have supported McClellan most likely as being the one that could help to solve uh, the nation's problems and have peace. All right, so this person right here is Thaddeus Stevens. He, along with Charles Sumner, were the most vocal of the radical Republicans, and what they wanted was a complete and absolute victory. They wanted punishment for the Confederacy. They wanted equal rights for freed slaves. They wanted the abolition of slavery very rapidly, and they opposed Lincoln only because they felt that he was being too moderate. Uh, they wanted him to be more forceful in what he did. So Lincoln had appointed several of these people to his cabinet, including Sam and Chase, William Seward, and Edwin Stanton, and many of them were his closest advisors, right? And as I said, this is Thaddeus Stevens here. All right, so with the presidential election, it looks like a pretty good win for Lincoln. All of those red states voted for him. The two blue states voted for, oh, three blue states voted for McClellan. And the South, of course, wasn't in it, neither were the territories. And while it looks like a huge victory for Lincoln, um, he got 55% of the popular vote, while McClellan got 45. So um, even though this time he did get um, the majority of the popular vote, of course, the South wasn't there, right? They didn't have a say. Um, McClellan still did really well. All right, so about the same time, this was February of 1865, Lincoln kind of went behind the scenes. This would have infuriated radical Republicans had they known about it. But Lincoln and Secretary of State uh, William Seward, he met, they met with a contingency of Confederates on the steamboat at Hampton, Virginia, uh, to negotiate peace. He did it to appease the more moderates in his party, um, to try to gain their support for the 13th Amendment. So he's playing politics um, to, to get this done. He kind of had them waiting there for a long time. Anyway, nothing came of this because the Confederates were not allowed to negotiate anything. Uh, all, they could, all they could demand was that they have their independence, and Lincoln wasn't willing to allow that to happen. But it is something that did take place. This guy here, this is Alexander Stevens. He is the vice president of the Confederacy, and he's older than 12. All right, so then Lincoln gives his second inaugural address. This is March of 1865. We're just a month away uh, a little bit shy of um, the South surrender at Appomattox Courthouse. So in this inaugural address, he takes a very conciliatory tone, right? Um, and it's a moderate policy. It kind of notes his policy towards reconstruction with malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right. Let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, 
to do all which may and achieve a just and a lasting peace among ourselves and to our nation. So uh, that is a conciliatory tone. I don't know that the South really cared. All right, so here's the progress of the war. The, the colors show the, <clears throat> the areas that um, the North obtained and what years, right? So 1861 are the really light years, 1862, kind of that darker tan years, 1863, the green, um, that area there, and then the, the purplish color that you can see where Sherman's March to the Sea is. So what they're doing is they're moving on and capturing all those locations. Notice that Richmond is among that. The city fell on April 3rd, 1865. Okay, so the, the city fell. Lincoln got word of it um, by telegraph. Um, and this had been a goal for the Union Army from the beginning. It wasn't far from Washington, D.C. I think it's further than 100 miles. Um, anyway, uh, Lee's defenses broke, and he heads west, and then Grant pursues him. And then we get the Union Army coming down from the north. Confederate leaders on the 2nd, they start packing everything up. Trainload after trainload is taking them and their supplies south. Um, and then on the four, well, and then that night, I guess some people, uh, drunk and rowdy, they end up burning, uh, they end up rioting, and then a fire starts, and then the fire spreads, and most of Richmond burn. Lincoln shows up there on April 4th. He took a boat down, and then as the boat is coming up the James River, it's bogged down because there's like dead horses and debris and all sorts of horrible things in the river. And so Lincoln ends up um, with his son, Tad. Uh, they're in a, a rowboat and they're rowing. They are not rowing. Somebody's rowing them in. Uh, Lincoln gets off the boat. He walks a couple of miles to Jefferson Davis's home. Along the way, um, free black people came up and they were kneeling at his feet uh, and they went to go kiss his feet. And apparently Lincoln said, that's not right. You must kneel to God only and thank him for the liberty you will afterward enjoy. So he went on, he walked to Jefferson Davis's home and he toured the home. Um, he asked some questions of the people there um, and, and he met with leaders from both the Confederacy and um, Union generals, and then one of the generals asked him what should be done with the Confederates, and Lincoln replied, if I were in your place, I'd let them up easy, let them up easy, and this is kind of the tone that Lincoln was going to take, as you could tell, too, with the second inauguration, where he's going to be very, very lenient with the South, well, the way he wanted to be. So anyway, the final um, battle of the war, this is the campaign. You can see from Petersburg, um, this is where Lee's army just continues to go westward, but they're halted by the mountains. Um, I think a bridge was out or something like that. Um, so they're cut off. Uh, eventually they have no supplies, they have no place to go. So Lee surrenders, he sends somebody to Grant to negotiate a plan for the surrender. Um, and so they decide to meet at the small town, a little village called Appomattox Courthouse, more than just the courthouse, a few more buildings. Um, so they go uh, to this one guy's house. It's ironic, the guy moved there um, because he was at Bull Run and the, the fighting took place near his home. And he's like, I gotta get away from this. So he moved his family out for the West and then the war ended at his home. So it began and ended at the same place. So Grant and Lee meet at this home. Um, the guy's name is Wilmer McLean. Um, but anyway, so they meet at this home at one o'clock in the afternoon, they had agreed to it. Lee is there, very sharp in his uniform. Uh, Grant is kind of disheveled, but that was kind of usually the case. Uh, and the two had met in the Mexican-American War. Lee made quite an impression on Grant, but Lee couldn't remember Grant. Um, if you look behind Grant there, there are two people. The one in the Union uniform was his scribe, a Native American who wrote everything down. And what they did is they discussed what the conditions for the surrender would be. And Grant was very generous, um, and 
he wanted to help to maintain their dignity. He thought that this would be a better way of unifying the country. And of course, he's taking instructions from President Lincoln, who ordered him not to make any political decisions. Um, he could only accept their surrender to stop the fighting. Um, so they said that the soldiers could keep their horses and their weapons, but they were to leave and to go home. Um, they also gave them uh, rations. So they gave them food because they were all very, very hungry. Then the war's over. Then five days later, um, President Lincoln and his wife um, are going to go to Ford's Theater with, um, well, first they invite the Grants, um, but Mrs. Grant declined, probably because she didn't like Mary, uh, but who knows? So the, the Grants can't go. So there's a young officer by the name of Henry Rathbone and then his fiancee, Clara Harris, who go to the theater with the Lincolns. Um, John Wilkes Booth, along with others, had conspired to previously, they were going to uh, kidnap Lincoln and take him to the South. But then that plan failed um, with the surrender. And so what they planned on instead is that they were just going to kill him. They were going to kill um, Johnson and they were gonna kill the Secretary of the State, William Seward. And so that you have one, two, and three in line for the presidency. And they thought that this would create so much chaos for the Union that then the South could come back and, and um, reassert itself. So anyway, Booth was a famous actor. He knew Ford Theater very well. He kind of planned it out. He comes in from behind um, the security guard who was in the hallway was sleeping. He sneaks in. Um, to the box, the viewing box where Lincoln and the others were located. He shoots Abraham Lincoln in the back of the head. Um, he stabs Rathbone as Rathbone is coming towards him. And then he jumps over the balcony. You guys all know this story. And he yelled out something in Latin, seek temper tyrannus. So uh, thus ever to tyrants, basically calling Lincoln a tyrant. So he co-conspired with some others to kill Lincoln, Johnson, and Seward. Um, and then the co-conspirators were Leslie Powell. He went to go kill Secretary of State Seward. Um, in doing, um, he went through and he actually stabbed like two of his children, hit one to where he had a skull fracture. Um, he attacked Stewart's nurse because Stewart was there. He had had, um, I think he broke his jaw or something on a horseback ride. Uh, and then also his bodyguard was injured. So he injured um, like six people all together. Uh, Stewart's going to recover from his injuries. There's also a guy by the name of George Azarot who was supposed to kill President Johnson, but he backed out because he got too scared. So anyway, here's Ford's Theater. Here's the playbill for the movie. It's Our American Cousin. It was um, supposed to be very, very funny, and I guess Lincoln just really enjoyed um, the show. Here's an image of what happened, and Lincoln was shot in the back of the head. Then a few soldiers took him over across the street to a boarding house and placed them in this bed. You can go to the boarding house to get today, and the bed is very short. They had to put them in sideways. Um, there's no way all of these people could have fit in that room at one time, uh, but apparently a lot of people were coming in and out to pay um, their respects. Um, the, the president was breathing through the night, but he was paralyzed, probably didn't feel a thing, and then he died at 7.22 a.m. the next morning at the age of only 56. Um, that would have been two years younger than me. So anyway, then Edwin Stanton, who's standing to the right there, he is credited with saying now he belongs to the ages. Very pro profound. Okay, here are the co-conspirators. We have the top left, that's John Wilkes Booth. And then to the right up there is David Harold. Um, he was supposed to be with Leslie Powell, um, but he kind of, when, when Powell went in um, to to do what he was doing, um, he he took off, right? So he and Booth um, tried to make it to Maryland, 
or they, but they tried to, they, they left DC and they tried to make it to Virginia, right? And in Virginia, that's when they were surrounded. They were at a tobacco barn that caught on fire and um, Harold surrendered, Booth was shot um, and he died a few hours later. They just kind of let him there, I guess, bleed out. Um, and then Leslie Powell, the bottom left, and then um, George Azerot, uh, the bottom right, uh, were all tried and executed uh, for the crime. And this is the execution right here. Mary Surratt um, was executed, apparently a co-conspirator, first woman to uh, be executed in the United States. Um, a lot of the meetings were being held at her boarding house, and then so she was accused of being a part of it. Um, there's some discrepancy whether or not she was. There's a new movie, I think, that's out about that, too. Anyway, the effects of the war, there's a lot of effects uh, as a result of this war. Um, political change is probably one of the biggest uh, in the sense. Um, so what we have here, the Republicans had an overwhelming majority in the Senate, and they're going to continue to hold the presidency uh, for some time, um, be a very powerful party in the United States. But they were divided into factions. And as I told you before, you had the Republican, the radical Republicans and then the moderate Republicans. And then you had the Democrats, there were the war Democrats, the peace Democrats, and then the most ardent of the peace Democrats were known as the Copperheads. And this is a political cartoon of them to the right. Um, these people wanted peace. They wanted um, to be separate from, they wanted an independent country. Um, and a lot of people who joined those uh, were people from the Midwest. They kind of had alliances or connections with people in the South. Uh, like people in the South, they were farmers. Um, also, the Irish supported them because the Irish were fearful that if black people were freed, they'd come up, they would come up north and take their jobs and they'd have to compete with African Americans. So anyway, as a result, as I've already talked about in part one, Lincoln suspended habeas corpus and other things, and a lot of people feel as if their civil liberties were being destroyed. So if you look at this uh, picture right here, Abraham Africanus I, his secret life, basically saying that uh, he's a tyrant, he's a king, he favors, you know, he's the king of the Africans, right, so of uh, black people. Anyway, he did suspend habeas corpus, and a lot of people were held in prison uh, without giving the benefit of a court hearing or anything like that, or even being told while they're being held. Um, they did that, you know, if they spoke out against the government or anything like that. Uh, throughout the course of the war, about 13,000 people were held. They also established uh, martial law. So military commanders in uh, various areas would arrest and detain individuals who they deemed to be a threat. Probably the most vocal of all of the Copperheads was this guy. His name is Clement Vallandigham, and he was from Ohio, and he gave speeches basically condemning Lincoln, um, saying that the war was unnecessary, um, that we shouldn't be at war, that it was a, a despot who put us there, um, a war for the freedom of blacks and the enslavement of whites basically is what he's saying. So he's very, very vocal. Uh, a military tribunal tried him um, and then put him in prison. Uh, Lincoln actually commuted his sentence but kicked him out of the country. Uh, and he ended up, his wife can go to the south, uh, and he ended up going to Canada. So to challenge this, we're going to get a Supreme Court case. Now, there was uh, Ex parte Merriman that we talked about earlier, um, but this one is Ex parte Milligan. Um, this guy, Lambden Milligan, he was a lawyer, um, and he was tried for plotting to overthrow the government, and he was sentenced to death in a military court. His case worked it way, his way through the court, and it went to the Supreme Court in 1866, where you have a... Um, uh, let's see, somebody, um, Roger Tawney, who kind of uh, identifies with Milligan. He's pro-slavery, pro pro-South. Um, but anyway, um, he, the court ruled that it was unlawful to try civilians in military courts if a civilian court were available. But it did uphold the president's right 
to suspend habeas corpus uh, during um, times of war. Okay, we'll hurry and get through this because I think I'm putting myself to sleep. All right, another thing that occurred uh, during this war is we get the first draft in United States history. Forced for both the Union and the, the Confederacy drafted people to serve in the military. This is called construction. Um, so the first conscription laws uh, in the Union were in March of 1863, and it said that anybody between the age of 20 man to 45 was required to serve in military service. However, you could get a substitute. Oftentimes, rich people paid substitutes to do that, or you could pay a $300 exemption fee and not have to go. So rich people didn't have to go, and poor people did. This infuriated people. And so draft riots broke out in New York City in July of 1863 against wealthy people and against black people. So people were angry at black people because they thought we're going off to war to die because of you black people. So they're blaming them. Um, also, some people thought that black people, if they got their freedom, uh, would come and compete for their jobs in New York City. All in all, about 117 people were killed. Many of them were black. Uh, and all total, about 250,000 people between the ages of 18 and 35 years old were drafted. Only about 6% of them um, served. The rest paid um, to be have their, their draft um, commuted, their draft time commuted. The Confederacy, they kept getting more and more stringent. They started off with the 18 to 35-year-olds and then 45 year olds, and then it went up to 50 year olds, right? Um, and conscripts account for about 25% to 33% of all of their army. Okay, here's an image, uh, wanted a substitute, and here's some rich man going into some poor place, or there's a bunch of paupers here, you can get these people to do it for you. Uh, so people were furious. And then um, here's a draft of black soldiers uh, into the war. And then this shows where fighting broke out or rioting broke out in um, New York City from July 13th through the 16th in 1863. And their target in most cases were black people. Um, buildings burned, people were beaten, people were hanged. Um, clubs, oftentimes when uh, you see Irish people, they're, they're drawn like this. So now you know what those are. Um, and then here you show an individual who is lynched who is black. All right, financing the war, both the, the Confederacy and the Union printed paper money. Uh, the most way that the Union paid for the war, 2.6 billion, um, was through borrowing, and then they also sold for. $400 million worth of bonds. So you can see their dollar too. They printed greenbacks uh, up on the top. Abraham Lincoln is on, um, on that $10 bill. Um, Congress also passes a new tariff, which is the morale tariff of 1861, which increased um, a tariff on goods coming into the country from 5 to 10%. Uh, they imposed the first income tax. It's 10% on the income over 5,000. I think that your book said um, something different. So we have different uh, opinions here and there. I'm not going to ask you on those. Also imposed an excise tax, tax on many goods that you buy. Mostly, like we have to pay a tax on um, gasoline. So it'd be like um, their luxury items, billiard tables, jewelry, yachts, stuff like that. They also um, issue paper money, which are greenbacks, and we get a uniform banking system. South did some of the same things. I wanted to show you this, um, this $100 bill here, Confederate money. They've got John C. Calhoun on it. But anyway, their economy was in shambles. Um, they they did impose a tariff, and surprisingly, it, it did earn some money over the four years, $3 million. It's not much, um, but there was something. Uh, but anyway, they also if issued Confederate money. This is some of it right here. And they increased taxes on people's property and their slaves. Um, but the main thing they did was issue this paper money. They didn't make it compulsory, and so there wasn't a lot of faith in it. And so what happens is you're going to get a lot of 
inflation, it rose 9,000%. And that's what the chart here on the right, you can see the union, they, everything kind of was steady, but in the South, it was crazy. All right, also uh, another change that's gonna occur as a result of the war is that the increase uh, manufacturing and modernization of the North. Uh, there's going to be more and more people moving to urban areas. By the time the war is over, 26% of the population is there. Um, we're also going to, some people are going to amass great wealth. And so this is going to lead us into the Gilded Age, where these very, very wealthy people um, control these huge trusts. And so this is going to bring us into the second industrial revolution after the war. All right, also because the Republicans have control of the House and the Senate, they just pass a whole bunch of pieces of legislation. And if you remember, they were wanting internal improvements, they wanted a tariff, uh, they wanted a banking system, all of these different things, and they're gonna get it, right? So we get the morale tariff, which increases the tariff on goods coming into the country. They had been calling too for a Homestead Act. They're gonna do that and give away land. We're gonna get a Legal Tender Act, and with this, we're gonna get greenbacks. That there's the land-grant colleges, the Emancipation Proclamation. We're gonna build a transcontinental railroad, and there's gonna be the National Bank. So here's the Homestead Act. People could go and live on 160 acres. It's a small fee that they had to pay, but they had to be there for five years and make improvements, uh, and then it was theirs. So you have this, this family living in this, this really nice sod home out on the prairie. There was nothing else to use to build with it, so they, they did it with sod. We'll talk more about that when we get there. Also, there were land-grant colleges, and so the federal government gave states money if they create colleges where they do agricultural research, engineering, and military tactics. So you had to have all of those different things. And so they gave them this land. There's like 106 different colleges, universities. And if you look at Illinois right there, the University of Illinois is a land grant college. As are, as is Purdue, um, there's quite a few, uh, quite a few in the Big Ten. Um, actually are land grant colleges. I think all of them. Okay, and then building of the Transcontinental Railroad, um, the, kind of the orange and the green coming together there at Promontory, Utah. Um, so it began in 1863 with the Union Pacific, and then there was the Central Pacific coming from California, and it joins up in 1869, uh, and we get the Transcontinental Railroad. We're going to talk about that too in future chapters. And then for women, there's some social changes. Um, probably one of the most noted is that now the profession of nursing is open. And um, because women had an expanded role during the war uh, where they took the place of men, they start now pushing um, for suffrage. And so we're going to see that there's a big suffrage movement uh, that continues until the 19th Amendment is ratified in 1920. Right, if you look at uh, the cost of the war in terms of death, uh, this was the costliest of all. I know the book says something like there's 750,000 people who died or something. Um, I'd always heard about 600,000, um, and that's what this chart here says. Um, and if you add up basically between the, the North and the South, and you see the, the losses, uh, the Union armies had from 2.5 to 2.5 seven um, men, and then they lost um, about 360,000. Uh, most people who died, died from disease. So it, that could be like even gangrene, you lost a leg, your leg had to be cut off, and then it got infected, right? Um, the South had between 750,000 to 1.2 million people, and they lost about 258,000. All right, thanks for listening and for your patience.